Everybody, good morning. Mentor session uh, with Todd Ferguson for AO. Welcome, everybody. Uh, if you guys haven't met me, my name is Todd Ferguson. Uh, my wife and I own a e-commerce business in Southern Missouri, as well as a 3PL warehouse, which people send us products to fulfill for their e-commerce websites. So that's a little bit about us. We will be at Summer Social. So if you guys are there, we'd love to meet up and talk with you. So let's get into today's questions. All right, first question comes from Carrington. Uh, Carrington asks here, how could I make a loyalty program effective for my business? So business description and background question. I own a photography agency focused on creating unique and creative product imagery for clients using digital to use digitally to increase online sales. I've been unsuccessful over the past year or so to figure out a subscription model that would help bring in more clients slash revenue and retainer or additional monthly income. I was wondering if a loyalty program where people can earn points and get rewards to excite them and spark more reoccurring bookings. I would love to hear your ideas on whether a loyalty program like this would be good for my business um, or what other options you would look at in order for me to create uh, clients, retainer clients as opposed to one-off bookings. Thanks so much. So for me, if I think about when I choose a company, whether it's a service-based company or a product-based company, I'm usually not choosing them because of a loyalty program or the loyalty program that they have. I'm choosing them because of a referral. I'm choosing them because of a testimonial. I'm choosing them because um, that, they, that they have quality products. So loyalty programs for me are more designed to keep people with you. So if you're competing with uh, another photographer, then you would want a loyalty program to incentivize your customers or clients to stay with you. So it sounds to me like you need to potentially work on more customers, building your pipeline at the top or your funnel, filling your pipeline, and possibly looking at, I don't, I don't know exactly what type of photography you do, if it's, if it's people, if it's products, if it's structures, but find the people that are not necessarily influencers, but people that are at the top of that level of, of the, the things that you're doing. So for us, like we're in the Amazon space. So I, if I was a photographer, I would look for people that are in the Amazon space that have a big following that are large sellers, potentially offer them a discounted rate in, in, uh, in exchange for referrals. So that's, that's the way I look at it here. So I, I don't know if a loyalty program, as far as photography too, I'm not really familiar with that, but a loyalty program, I'm not sure how you would create that to get people to, to initially sign up with you. So just my thoughts there. So good luck with that. Second question comes from Robin. Robin asks, from a timeline perspective, what time frame should, should I be looking at to hit six figures in my business? Business description and background of questions. I'm an up and coming artist. I work, I'm working on building my portfolio, learning to sell, as well as my even my own personal development. I come from a very limited mindset and I am growing every day too, thanks to AO. How do I know if I'm on the right path? I am happy and I know it's going slow, but how do I know if things are on the right path? How do I, how did you determine that for me? So for me, the time frame you can get to 100,000, you can get to a million, you can get to 10 million as quick as you choose to do that. You just talked about how it's a mindset thing for you and it's a limited mindset. So the things that I would work on for you, it you know, it would be getting out of that limited mindset. If you haven't read the book Mindset by Carol, I think it's The Wick, I would check that out. It talks about a fixed versus a growth mindset. I know you've been reading uh, Atomic Habits by James Clear, and that, that's probably helped. But the thing is, is that you can you can scale almost any business as quick as you want. For you, it's a confidence issue, a confidence. Thing, I guess is what you would call it, a mindset shift that you would need to have. And as far as on the right path, you know, doing a hundred thousand, making a hundred thousand, doing a million, making a million, that's if, if that doesn't line with you and your goals, then then you're not gonna be happy. And you talk about how you're happy and you know it's going slow. So you just have to ask yourself, are you okay with with that? Sorry. All right, are you okay with that? Are you okay with 
with running uh, slow with increasing that way are, are you okay with that so if, if you're not then you need to make some some changes and you need to to uh, work on your mindset but if you're okay with that if you're happy with that then then you're just on the right path for me I had certain goals that I wanted to hit I had certain things that I wanted to do and that that was that was how I decided if I was doing well or not so hopefully hopefully that helps Robin All right. Uh, next question is from Brad, kind of along this a similar timeline. It says, uh, how do you know when it's the right time to leave your full-time job and go all in on your business? So business description and background of question. I'm currently a full-time firefighter and a paramedic for a local municipality. I have 13 years of service invested with 12 more for retirement. The climate has changed drastically, and although I never dreamed I would even consider leaving the fire service, I find myself struggling to find a reason to stay. My business has been growing slowly over the last several years, but it's still not at a point where I feel comfortable leaving the guaranteed income of my fire job. However, I'm totally burnt out and ready to leave. It's the fear that's holding me back and the lure of guaranteed income and benefits that keeps me there. So how do I know when it's the when it's the right time or should I when should I make the leap? So this is one of those questions that you could ask 20 different entrepreneurs, you're probably going to get 20 different answers. It really just depends on your risk tolerance. It depends on your commitments as far as your family, as far as debt, as far as obligations like that. When I decided to go full-time and just leave my full-time job, I was full-time into my business, it was in 2013. My wife and I, it was just us. We didn't have any kids. We didn't have a ton of debt. We didn't have um, a lot of different things that we were obligated to, and so, that made it easier. I'm also a risk taker. Um, I also know that I can accomplish certain certain things and I can um, make certain things happen. So if you are needing the comfort and the guarantee of an income, if you're needing the retirement benefits that you talk about, if you're needing all of that, then it's not the right time. You know, you, you've got to get to that point to where you're comfortable doing that and that you're comfortable taking the leap. The second thing is that, you know, it's, it's the same thing that, that Robin talked about. She talked about um, kind of a fixed mindset, not a growth mindset. And so things I, I would suggest that you read the um, mindset book as well. Having six months or so worth of income saved in an emergency fund for personal and then also your business would be smart. Um, looking for a mentor or a coach that can help you scale faster than you currently are because you talked about how you're growing your business slowly over the past several years the thing is is when you go full-time if you're not at a point to where you can make a full-time income you've got to scale your business faster than you ever have and so that takes a different type of mindset that takes some coaching that takes you know things are going to pop up that you're not used to so i would definitely uh, look at that so i think i had another thought but it has left me this morning so anyway, hopefully that helps, Fred. All right, next question is from Lissandra. What things would you recommend I can do to get as many leads as possible and also track those leads when at a trade show? So business description and background is, I have a baking business that specializes in desserts for wedding and special events. We attend trade shows to increase awareness and to get leads to offer our services for weddings. What things have you found that, that help get leads while the show? And then how do you track that after the show? Do you do, you do giveaways, offer discounts, You're open to all ideas? Thanks. So I'm assuming you're talking about you you're, are, are showing at a trade show, so you're a, a vendor, you're not a, an attendee. So I'm, I'm coming this, at this from an attendee standpoint. Uh, we have attended I don't know, 30 or 40 different trade shows over the years. So I've never been a vendor there, but I've been an attendee. So the things that we notice at trade shows is, first of all, they're not cheap. The ones that we go to anyway, they're not cheap to exhibit at. They are not cheap to get to. Generally, you're, you're taking team members with you, so there's payroll. You're also potentially stopping your business so you can be there. So there's a lot of things that go in, into that equation to make it profitable so I would definitely look at those things 
And then also we experience a lot of things, a lot of vendors, a lot of booths where people are on their phones, they're not interactive, they look like they're very disinterested. Oftentimes those are not the owners or the CEOs or the presidents, those are just the employees. So that would be one thing I, is make sure that you're interacting with people that are walking by, make sure you're interacting with as well as you can with, with people that are attending and then do something, something memorable. So if you're, if you're attending, you know, bridal shows or you're, you're exhibiting at bridal shows, you got to do something that catches people attention, get something that, that gets them to stop just the generic, Hey, how's it going? Are you getting married or, or, you know, for us, it's, they, they ask questions like, do you sell this product? I mean, it's very easy for us to say, no, we don't because we're not interested, but you've got to get them to stop. You've got to introduce them to your booth. You've got to introduce them to, to what you're, why you're different, but you've got to create something that allows you an opportunity to get them to stop while they're walking the trade show. So maybe you hire a magician, maybe you hire, I don't know, somebody playing music if you can do that, but get, get something to get somebody's attention. I mean, if you think about it, when you're at, when I'm at a trade show, crowds draw people, empty booths do not. So if, if there's four or five or 10 people at a booth watching something happen, it just draws other people in. You're wondering what's going on. You're wondering, you know, what might be going on over there and then people stop. And that's, that's the kind of stuff that you want, whether it's a celebrity or whether like it's, it's a part of, it's a show or whatever it is. So that might be something to think about. As far as tracking leads to at the show, there's all types of CRMs. I know um, at the last event that I was at, we had the Tiger LRM. They came and talked. It's a lead lead generation, not lead generation, but a, a way to, to track your leads. And so this would be something so you can input those into there, talk about when you contacted them, when you follow it up, when you send them an email, when you send them a postcard. So that would be a great thing. I know there's tons of other tools. And then also is... I would make it a point at the end of that day, so if let's just say it's a three-day trade show or even a, a one-day trade show, I would contact them as soon as you can. I would contact them that afternoon, that evening. Maybe you have a, a person that's there that all they do is contact people every 30 minutes. So if you get 10 new leads, they're sending them a text or an email or calling them, whatever it is, and, and maybe you know 30 minutes is too quick, but have a system so for me, when I'm at a trade show, as a, as a customer, when I'm interested in product or I need a list of products and I give them my business card, the thing that I always ask them is like, can you send me that tonight? Because I'm interested, I, I wanna do something now. So if people, if you're getting their information, that's the first step of them being interested or you've created something that they wanna give you their information. So I would follow up as soon as possible, definitely that night. I would not wait till you get back to the office or to you know your home because stuff happens and then leads to fall through the cracks. So I would just follow up as soon as possible. So. Hopefully that helps, Lissandra. All right, next question is from Rosalia. Says, uh, what strategies have worked for you when engaging and interacting with online Facebook and social media groups in order to attract new clients? So business description and background of question. I have an accounting firm and we focus on small business owners. This month we've joined a few Facebook groups to introduce the firm to more people looking for ideas to attract new clients, thanks. So again, this is not something that we normally do, but I, I listen to enough stuff. I've heard you know, people talk about this. And the one thing is to get in there and to be as beneficial to that group as you can or to help that group and not immediately pitch your services or try to attract customers. We have an e-commerce Facebook group and we're always looking for people that will help add value to the group and that's one thing that we're looking for is when, we, when we're looking for partnerships, we're not just looking for it to be a one-way street if, if, if that's what you want to call it. So add as much value as you can, answer as many questions, and do that knowing that you might not get anything in return. But if you answer enough questions, your name starts popping up on post all the time. People are interacting with you. You're asking questions that make people think. As soon as your name pops up more, people are gonna wonder who you are, then they're gonna click on your profile or your business profile, and then potentially that's that's how you can get new customers. But when you're going in trying to just find new customers and, and, and you're not adding value, most groups don't generally enjoy that as far as Facebook groups. You might even look for, for paid Facebook groups. You, you might wanna narrow down your niche. I know small business owner, that's a, that's a, a massive niche, entrepreneurship. So maybe you look for e-commerce sellers, maybe you look for bakers, maybe you look for photographers, and you really narrow that down 
and you get really good at that, and then you find smaller subgroups to where you can add more value. If you're getting in a group that has 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 people, it's very tough to, to get traction. But if you get in a group that has 200, 300 people, and you can be that authority figure in that group, then, then that's, that's probably the best route to go. All right, uh, next question is from Leanna. It says, how do I find money to pay for things as a new business owner when cash flow is super tight and we just don't have money for certain things like websites, marketing, et cetera? Business description and background. So I've been trying to set up a website myself, but it's been very difficult. I've checked YouTube, how-to videos, tutorials, etc., but it's far too confusing for me. I've looked into Fiverr, but I'm hesitant. I know I need a better e-commerce website and something and some other things for business in order to grow sales, but I feel stuck knowing how to get it done and pay for it. What did you do? What did you do to find money to pay for things in the beginning? So I think we've all kind of been through that stage of bootstrapping, which it seems that's where you are. For me, I've never been afraid to hire things out. There are lots of things that as entrepreneurs we need to know, but then there's also things, you know, if you're in a product-based business, which you are, and you need to sell product to make money, that's the thing I would be focusing on now. Yes, the e-commerce site is gonna help, but you've gotta find ways to sell more product, get in front of more people, get referrals, and then I would use that money to to pay for website hosting to find somebody to do it for you you know another thing too is i don't know if you posted this but inside of ao there's support saturday to where you can ask these type of questions i'm looking for somebody to help me optimize my e-commerce site or who do you guys know that can help me optimize my e-commerce site and there are people in ao that that definitely can help i know i'm, I'm working with somebody right now that is setting up ours as well but if you're spending time on YouTube or doing it yourself, just ask yourself, how much money are you worth per hour? Are you worth 50 bucks an hour? Are you worth $100 an hour? Are you worth $200 an hour when you sell your product, when you're out networking? What are you worth? And sometimes it's, it's difficult to do that, but we, you, can, you can put a rough dollar figure on there. And if you can pay somebody less than what you're worth to do that, then usually that's a good investment. So if you need to go sell, I believe you sell caviar, if you need to sell, find two new retail outlets that you can sell your product to, that's where you should focus your attention knowing that you can make 500 bucks or 1,000 or 2,000, or if you get reorders, you can make more and then you funnel that money back into your, your, your website development. I mean, stuff you can do too, if you're really tight on money, you can trade. I mean, people don't really talk about that a whole lot, but if you have a product and somebody has a service and you both need what the other have or has or the, the, the service-based business likes what you sell, you can trade. You can trade at full retail value. Um, so that would be something to think about too is to potentially find people that, that you can trade with. So hopefully that helps. All right, next question is from Kelly. Kelly asks, how do you deal with feeling vulnerable and anxious after letting everyone know everything about your business and what you are all about. So a business description and background of question, we strive for excellence as an excavation company specializing in trenching, site prep, road work, aggregate hauling, and heavy equipment operations. I'm feeling really vulnerable right now and super anxious. I'm going to all general contractors, the city halls, Cal Fire, residential builders, social media platforms, and generally letting it all hang out, trying to land a job slash sub subcontract. I didn't expect to feel like I am right now. So I'm a little not really sure what you mean by feeling vulnerable and anxious after letting it, everyone know all about your business and what you are. I mean, that, you're an entrepreneur. That You should be doing that daily. You should be letting everybody that you come in contact with know what you do. Anybody that can use any of those things that you just talked about trenching, site prep, road work, hauling, heavy equipment operations. Your job is to advertise your business everywhere you go. You should be a billboard or a walking advertisement for your business. So if you're uncomfortable doing that, then you need to work on your mindset as well. You need to work on not really caring what people think. Because if, if you're worried about getting a no, if you're worried about looking silly, if you're worried about anything like that, you are not going to be as successful as you potentially can be because you're always going to second guess yourself. You're always going to create some type of story in your head that's not true. You're always going to make something up that is going to prevent you from 
executing the way you need to. But you know, if you're if you're in all of these things, you know, your business card should say that. You should be wearing shirts. I mean, you think about Sean. Sean's always wearing most won't I will AO stuff. I don't know if he. I mean, I've seen him wear other stuff every now and again. But I mean, most of the time, that's what he's wearing. Like he's proud of his brand. And so, if you're not proud of your brand, if you're not proud of, of your business, you need to figure out why. Do you not do quality work? Do you not meet people's expectations? Do you not meet deadlines? Whatever the, the case may be, you got to figure out why you're not proud and work on those areas, and then just make sure that you're you're getting to a point to where you can walk in, you can confidently say what you do, and you can be proud about it. If you're not, then entrepreneurship is going to be it's going to be a long journey for you. I mean, you think about I think about Nick or Heather that I've you know or Joe. Think about people like that that are super proud, like they you know about their business, and they are extremely excited to tell you about it. They're they're excited to, to to tell you their growth strategies, and they're excited to let you know where they're going. And I mean, Joe like gets up there and confidently talks about his business, Joe the Home Pro. And so you know, and if you need to borrow that confidence from somebody like that, then then do it. But get to those levels when you know when you go to a an event, talk to the people that are confident that are confident about their business, and ask them how they got there. But that, that's what I would do if I was in your shoes, Kelly. All right, next question is from James. James asks, where can I find temporary a temporary assistant to perform a repetitive, although necessary, task? Business description and background of question. To improve SEO slash searchability, I'm revamping my website. And part of that includes recreating over 400 posts. It's a pretty step-by-step -step thing that doesn't involve too much thinking. But after doing about 40 of these, I realize my time is better spent elsewhere on my business. So first of all, congratulations on realizing that doing tasks like this, you can outsource those and realizing that your time is worth more than that. So we just talked about that a little bit earlier. There's multiple ways to do this. As far as a temporary assistant, you can go through a job search agency. You can, somebody that does job placements, you can do temporary help like that. It might turn into part-time. You can look for people that are looking for part-time jobs to work from home. In, in the United States, you can hire this out. You can find a, uh, it wouldn't be a social media company, but it would be, I don't even know what it would, I guess it would might potentially be a social media company or somebody that, that does website optimization. You can hire them out temporarily or on a part-time basis and just ask them, hey, what does this cost? I know there's several people in the group that do that. You can find somebody overseas. You know, the, the challenge with finding somebody overseas is there's usually a time frame difference. There's usually a language barrier. Um, even if they speak perfect English, there is sometimes just a, a interpretation barrier. But there's definitely different ways to do that. So figure out after this job is done, this temporary task, is there something else they could do for you in your business? So you, could you hire somebody part-time in the United States to work from home remotely? Could they come into your office and work 10 hours a week? Are there other things they could do? So hopefully that helps you there, James. All right, Ricardo is our next remember to ask a question it says how do you hire virtual assistants from another country do you add them on as pay or do you add them to payroll or do you simply wire them their wages for example hiring an assistant slash video editor in the Philippines Bus business description and background a question I'm interested in learning how to outsource using other countries talents I'm looking at other venues other ventures of business I want to know if any mentors have experience with this thank you so how do you hire a virtual assistant? Well, there's multiple ways. There is, I believe there's a mentor in the group that actually has a virtual assistant company that can help you out with that. So if you know specifically what you want, which it seems like you do, a video editor, you can they can train people for you. Usually those are a little more costly, more of an investment, but they're well worth it because you're getting somebody that's already trained. They take care of the, the management of that individual or people or team they find them for you, they do disciplinary action if they have to, they will replace them for you. So you're paying not just for that individual, but you're paying for the management of that person. You can go through places like Upwork or Fiverr or onlinejobs.ph. There's I know there's other ones too. Those are the ones that I have used. You create a job posting just like you would a normal job posting. If you're looking for a warehouse worker, if you're looking for a barber, you would create just a, a job description and what you're looking for find a way to have them when they send their resume or they send you a message back, have them figure out a way to have them 
complete a task for you so you can check for clarification. Then you do a video interview and, and you train them. So those people are generally cheaper. Cheaper is not the right word, just less expensive because you're doing the training on them. Even though somebody says on Fiverr or Upwork or wherever that they know how to do video editing, they know how to do payroll, they know how to do whatever, generally they might have a basic understanding but they don't know how to do it the way you want them to or they just don't know how to do it or maybe they've watched a YouTube video. So you have to be very specific and managing those individuals oftentimes is very challenging. I know for us, we've hired them through those platforms, Upwork, Online Jobs, PH, and Fiverr, and we have, I think we have close to 30 people right now that work for us overseas in the Philippines. But when we first started, I, I, I went through so many VAs because I was a horrible manager. I did not explain things well. I did not create videos like I should have. It was very frustrating for me, and so we almost gave up. And so if, if you want to hire an agency to handle that, get with Sean. He can introduce you to the, the mentor that does that. That might be your best option that way. So as far as you don't add them to payroll, there's no taxes, payroll taxes, anything like that. You, we pay ours through Payoneer. I know there's, uh, you can pay them through WISE or WAYS, W-I-S-E, I believe. You can pay them through PayPal. So you would just need to get with that individual. And then we pay ours every two weeks. That's how we do it. So hopefully that helps, Ricardo. All right, next question is from Greg. Should I set up KPIs for my business and why? Business description and background of question. I'm a web designer and development company. I've been introduced to KPIs, but I don't currently use them. How can they help me better organize my business and what KPI should I focus on? So for anybody that doesn't know, a KPI is a key performance indicator and it's basically a scorecard for your business and they all vary from business to business. So a broad set of KPIs, I mean, there are very general and basic KPIs that most businesses use to gauge their business performance month to month, quarter to quarter, year to year. But then there are some that are very industry specific. So as far as you know, web design and development, I'm not sure exactly what KPIs you would use. If you get with other individuals that are do similar work, then they can give you ideas as far as what KPIs they track. KPIs would be, you know, so would be how many leads did you pr produce this week? How many leads did you close? Or how many sales calls did you do? So yes, the answer is yes, you should have KPIs for your business, whether they're financial, whether they're leads, whether they are revenue based, what, whatever it is, yes, you should definitely have KPIs because if you don't, there's no way for you to know if you're winning or losing in this game of entrepreneurship. There's no way for you to really know just by looking at your bank account. That is not the way to run a business, right? You know, you need to have financials. You need to have stuff that you can talk to your team about. You need to have ways to motivate your team. You know, when you, when you start building out your team and you have managers and you have employees, you need to talk about, you know, what are, what are you tracking for us? We track revenue per hour, so the number of hours that our team has worked and how much revenue we've brought in, and that's our biggest key performance indicator, and that lets us know how much money we're making roughly per day and if we're profitable. We also track the number of mistakes that we make for customers, how many new customers we have, how many items we shipped out. I'm trying to think of what else we, we do. We look at how many SOPs we've done. We look at how many evaluations we've done. We look at very, you know, we have an actual scorecard. So one thing that we did is if you go through traction in the EOS model, they talk about a scorecard and, and it might be something for you to look at. And it's not set up for you, but it kind of gives you an idea. And so if you have a scorecard and you can talk to your team about that and you start tracking those numbers, you post them on the wall, you know, share the KPI to the team, that, that might help. So traction, I think it's by Gino Whitman, is a good book and uh, it talks about some of this stuff and so and it talks about your, your scorecard so I would definitely look at that. All right, last question, Ricardo again. Um, question they ask is what are some practical ways to show team members appreciation? Business description and background of question. I own and operate a barbershop with three other barbers. I want to continually show gratitude and appreciation. How can I practice this habit without breaking the bank? So the things, I, everybody's different right? Some people like gifts, some people like public recognition, some people like high five, some people like just, hey man, good job. Like a sincere good job. 
so I would ask them, first of all, you've got three barbers, have a team meeting and ask, like, how, how do you guys like me to show you appreciation? How do you like me to tell you you've done a, a great job? When we, at the end of the week, if we hit our numbers, what makes you feel like you're a part of that? Because most people just want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Most people want to be, they want to know that they're a part of something great, that they're appreciated. And so for some people, it may just be a genuine, you know, after, as they're leaving for the day, if you're in your office or you're done or whatever it is, that you generally just pull them aside and just say, man, I just want to say thank you. It could be a woman, whoever you're talking to, but I just want to say thank you. You did an amazing job today. I love having you part of this team. And I just want to like sincerely say thank you for your hard work. To some people, that is worth more than a, a $10 gift card, more than a $100 gift card, more than whatever it is. But some people enjoy gifts. Some people enjoy that. Maybe they want recognition. You have an employee of the month. Maybe there's that. But if you're worried about breaking the bank, first of all, set a budget. Right? Set a budget with how much you're going to do every month or every quarter or every year for employee recognition. And maybe you know you maybe you do a plaque and you have an employee of the month. Maybe you take everybody out for beers after lunch or after uh, work. Maybe you have a barbecue at your house. There's a lot of things that you can get really creative with There's a, and that you can do for very inexpensive. Uh, having an outing, like going, uh, you're in California, I don't know how close you are to the beach, but like if people like to surf and swim, like just go hang out at the beach for an afternoon, do a barbecue and you're talking, you know, 25, 50 bucks. But set a budget, stick with that. The thing is, is if, you, if you're always, if you always feel like you have to give your team something extra, it's never gonna stop and when you do, generally your performance of your team will decline. So I would just look for stuff that you can do that's inexpensive, that's not necessarily free, but that just takes people showing up. So if you say, hey, we're gonna to get together and we're gonna to go to the arcade, and I'm gonna give everybody a $20 gift card or, or whatever that is, then do that. But it's just creating camaraderie with your team, it's creating a bond with your team. So that way when they think, man, maybe there's a different opportunity, but I really love working here. Like Ricardo just takes care of me super flexible when I need time off with my kids, when I need, when my kid is sick, when there's a ball game, when there's a school event, he always makes sure that I'm off. That's the kind of stuff that I would really focus on. But again, just set a budget and go from there. So guys, that's it on the questions. Some really good questions and a lot of them. So guys, keep asking questions. I know today is Flex Friday. If you're watching this live, so make sure you guys do your flex. And then we've got the Summer Social coming up next weekend, which I am super excited about. So Guys, everybody have a great afternoon, great morning, and uh, we'll talk to you soon.